والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي So this is actually my first time in Vancouver in British Columbia and when you think Canada you think what cold you think cold and everybody assured me said don't worry Vancouver is different it never snows over there And now I'm walking in the bazaar and it's snowing outside. So if I have somebody ask do you have any criticisms right now for the conference or feedback? Yes, it's snowing outside and it should not be snow. But actually Canada actually like this country has is very dear to my heart. I'll tell you why. Whatever tiny little amount of knowledge Allah has blessed me to acquire, that journey started in Canada. It started in Canada. And I remember because I was I grew up in Southern California. And I left my house in December, and it was 75 degrees or so. It's always beautiful around there. And then I landed in Toronto, and it's snowing outside. And I said, "What have I got myself into?" But Alhamdulillah, that was the beginning of my journey of knowledge. So all the bases that I have in Arabic all started there. The grammar it was not in Egypt. When I went to Egypt, people would say, "Where did you learn Arabic?" I say, "I learned it in Canada." I said, just keeping it real. I'm just telling them how it is, right? We don't like people that are fake, do we? Now, Fahad said that he studied in San Antonio, right? He studied in San Antonio, and then he came back. Could you imagine when he got off the plane after four years in San Antonio, and he's got cowboy boots on, and he's got a cowboy hat on, right? And he starts talking funny, right? He's like, "Let's go to Tim Hortons, y'all." <laughs> you would say, "What? What happened to you?" Right? We don't like when people do that. So we always want to remember where we came from. And now that leads into our topic, our topic of a dual identity. So it seems sometimes people act one way at work, one way at home, one way at school. How do we avoid that? Uh, a little while back in my office, a brother was speaking to me. This brother is very well educated, has an excellent job, wonderful family. beautiful children and very active in the masjid gives what was a role model to the youth and he had just kind of disappeared from everybody from this like he stopped coming to the masjid people are wondering what's going on and he starts to tell me more he says you know it wasn't that long ago that i had plotted to commit suicide i was going to take my own life And he said I had it all planned out. I was going to drive to this particular highway and I was going to go off the road here and I was going to go out of the car and that's how I would have ended my life. So what happened? He went to a restaurant before. He went to a restaurant this is like a movie. Some random person, not Muslim, starts speaking to him. And he starts asking him, "What what are you doing?" He says, "Well, this is what I'm going to do." And so the non-Muslim looks at him and he says, You are the most selfish person I've ever met in my life. And something changed in his mind, alhamdulillah. Something changed. And he went back home and it was not like that again. And then he starts telling me why he was going to do that. How could somebody who seemingly had it all, who seemingly was attached to their being, how could they take this step that they were going to actually kill themselves? He said I had an addiction. What do you think his addiction was if I were to ask you? What do you think his addiction was? What would you say? Huh? Drugs? Alcohol? What did you say to that? Okay? He was addicted to pornography. This was his addiction. Now, I had no problems in the ummah in in one way. Some people say let's just bury our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. That's one way to handle it. I don't do that. Okay? I take it on and we know especially with the internet internet that this is a real struggle for people but this is what he was going to do he was going to take his own life so we ask ourselves the question what led him to this dual identity what led him to have a split personality that he could be so great in front of everybody but when he went home he had this dark secret so we're going to talk about why this happens and then most importantly how can we change it so number one let's understand something Why does the dual personality exist? We have to realize the nature of human beings. Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala said, "Wa khuliqa al-insanu 
Da'ifa. Mankind was created weak. So stop beating yourself up because you are not 100% perfect Muslim. Islam, is it perfect or imperfect? Islam, perfect. Human beings, are we perfect or imperfect? Way imperfect. So Islam is a perfect religion, but it came for imperfect people like us. So when you commit something wrong, or you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing, we make istighfar, of course we do. We're not brushing that aside, but stop acting like we're always supposed to be 100% super Muslim all the time. Do you feel the same, or you, the way you feel right now, you're walking in the bazaar, you're hanging around people of knowledge, are you going to feel like this on Monday? No, human, it's human nature. You're not going to be the same. The way you feel on the 27th of Ramadan, do you feel like that on the 28th of Ramadan? No, you don't, because the Iman is high. Iman fluctuates. The only people or creation of Allah whose Iman does not fluctuate are angels. لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون Allah says, angels don't disobey Allah. All they are created for is to worship Allah. That's it. Angels don't go to college. Angels don't get married. Angels don't play sports. Angels don't be. All they do is worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to realize this. Let's be, uh, let's, let's be realistic with our expectations and know that it's a constant process. We're always trying to improve little by little. Because if you're not improving every day in reality, what do you do? You are regressing. You're not progressing, you are regressing. And, what, and, and the Sahaba had this concern. So let me remind us now about the famous incident of Hanzala radiallahu anh. So Hanzala, Abu Bakr came to him radiallahu anh. And he says, how are you doing? And he says, nafaqa Hanzala, nafaqa Hanzala. He says, Hanzala has become a hypocrite. Now this is a pretty, you know, this is a very strong statement to make. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, he asks Hanzala, he says, why are you saying it? He said, you know, remember the Prophet sallallahu he is describing paradise and he's describing the hellfire, it's like we see it. And we leave and our iman is like level 10. But when we go back home and we're hanging out with our family and we go to our job and we do everything else, it's not the same. We don't feel the same, so I feel I'm a hypocrite. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anh is worried now because he says, I feel the same then. If you're saying that, this is how I feel. Let's go ask the Prophet So they go and they ask the Prophet And the Prophet says, what's wrong? What's the matter? He said, Ya Rasulullah, when we're with you and you describe paradise and you describe the hellfire, it's like we see it. But when we go back home to our families, and when we go back home to our kids, and when we have to work and have to do all these things, we, that level of iman drops, and we feel we are hypocrites. And that's when he says to him, the Prophet ﷺ says, Ya Hanzala, sa'a wa sa'a. Oh Hanzala, there's a time for this, and there's a time for that. Meaning, you can never be on this super high iman level all the time. And he said, if you could stay on that level, then the angels would personally come and shake your hands. In your beds, and in your paths, in the turq, on the way. But that's just not humanly possible. Our iman goes up, and our iman goes down. But what we're trying to do is get to a level, so that when we do have a dip, we don't just fall apart. Okay? So this is very important, I want us to understand, to not put unrealistic expectations on us, so that we're always depressed and think we can't do anything. One of the names of shaitan is Iblis. Iblis comes from Ya'as, which means, to lose hope. So what Shaitan wants you to do, he wants you to lose hope. He wants you to think that, no, oh, you don't know, bro, you don't know what I did last night. No, I can't come to the conference. It's not for people like me. What do you mean it's not like for people for you? It's for everybody. It's for everybody. So he makes you lose hope and think that you cannot go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know the Prophet said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every human being makes mistakes. But who are the best of those? at tawabun those who repent to Allah. You know what tawbah means literally? Tawbah means turning. So you make a mistake and you do what? You make a U-turn. Now one of Allah's names is at tawab which means the one who always makes a U-turn. Now how does Allah turn back to us? Allah doesn't need us. Allah doesn't need us. The way Allah turns back to us is that when we make tawbah, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps turning back and accepting it. And Allah holds no grudge against you. You could disobey Allah for 10 years. And you decide on the 11th year that I'm going to get serious, instantly Allah will forgive you. You could disobey Allah for 50 years. And you decide one day I'm going to start obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's it. You will accept it. Now for human beings, it doesn't work like that. Human beings, you could argue with them for 15 minutes. You know? You could tell them, you're a Spurs fan and I'm a Lakers fan. All of a sudden, hey, I'm not talking to you anymore. Just simple little thing with you. This is how human beings are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like that. So Allah always turns. So let's understand this. A second reason, very important reason. Why do we feel a double identity or two identities develop? The reason this happens is because we are told that you are a Canadian or an American or you are a Somali or a Pakistani or a Turk and you cannot be both. And I'm here to tell you today that that is absolutely false. That is completely false. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلَ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنًا Allah describes the believers and He said they are those that listen to speech and they take the best of it. So that means what? If somebody is saying something, do you have to take and accept every single thing they're saying? No. What do you take? You take whatever is beneficial. If I say something, you can reject 99% of the things that I say. But maybe there's something which is beneficial, so what do you do? You accept that. It is the exact same way when it comes to things in general. We take the best. How many people here immigrated to Canada? How many people? Okay, quite a large population. If I ask you why did you do it? Or why did your parents do it? They're going to say, well, because they came for the best education. They came for something better, did they not? That is why they came. So you don't have to choose between being one or being the other. You take the best of both. So let's now take, let's call wherever, uh, whatever culture your, your parents came from, let's call that the East. And with respect to my convert brothers and sisters, it's the same principle. So I'm not leaving you guys out either. Let's call it the East. And then let's call the other side the West. So that, that will be like Canada, or I have, to, I have to keep saying Canada, not America. Canada or America. Let's call that the West. There are things that we can take from the East, which we should be taking, which are 100% Islamic values. Like what? In the East, do we respect our elders generally or not respect them? We respect them. In fact, in the West, we're one of the few cultures that doesn't respect their elders. It's very strange, actually. If you go to the Asian cultures, you have the sensei. You know, like the Kung Fu movies? You have the wise man, the wise man with the long, stringy gray beard, and, and then the young, uh, you know, the young guy comes and he learns from him, right? Is that person respected? Of course he's respected. You have the guru. In Indian culture. You know, when we wanted to learn from scholars, we wanted to go to the, the person who was so old he could barely walk himself. Why? Because we knew that that combination of knowledge and experience is going to benefit us the most. So we used to try to find those people. So in the East, we respect our elders. And this is something, are you telling me Western society would not be better if they didn't respect their elders? Of course they would. And also, probably people will stop getting all this plastic surgery. Trying to become, you know, turn back the clock. You can't turn back the clock. So we have a respect and we should embrace that. We don't have to choose one or the other. In the East, are we more family oriented or less family oriented? More family oriented. In the West, it's more, it's about myself. I do this, right? I am like this. I will make my decision and I will move far away from my parents if it's better for me. I'm not worried about them. I'm not worried about them. It's all about me. So we are more family oriented. We are more selfless. Whereas in the West we tend to be more selfish. Selfish, right? Selflessness is to prefer others over yourselves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised the Ansar because they have this strict that they will give other people, even when they're hungry, they will give them their food. 
because they prefer others over themselves. Do we have that in the Eastern cultures? Yes, we do. What else do we have? Generally speaking, modesty. Generally speaking. Modesty not just in dress, but modesty in speech. A lot of the jokes that you guys hear in school and stuff, you would never hear that in Muslim countries. You would never see even men openly talking the kinds of crude talk that they talk about the opposite gender in Muslim countries. Yes, I know people do things behind doors, but I'm saying externally, you don't have that. And this is some of the benefits of the, of the East. Now, let's go to the benefits from the West. Now I know, I can just see some people rolling their eyes. Right? Here comes a guy who thinks he's a big American. Or somebody, Right? We're not saying that. We're telling you, listen to what we're saying first before judging. In the West, we have what? Do we have, generally speaking, do we have, uh, do we have order and structure? Yes. Yes. Try to get a visa to go somewhere in Canada. Make an appointment in and out in 30 minutes. Try to do that in Cairo, and it will take you maybe three days. And I'm not even exaggerating. And you'll have no idea where to go. You go to some guy over here, who's going to tell you to go to some guy over here, who's going to tell you to go back to the guy over here, who's now going to close his window because he wants to drink his tea. And you have no idea what you're doing. Okay? But here, alhamdulillah, we have order. We have structure. Do people here stop at the traffic lights? Yes, they do. You know, one time my brother, he was overseas. And he was driving. Uh, the, the driver says to him, he said, you're from America, right? So my brother says, yeah. He says, you think you have freedom? Check this out. And he steps on the gas and runs the red light. He said, I, I am free. Okay. So we follow those rules here, and it prevents a lot of things from happening, does it not? What else do we have here? Opportunity. We have opportunity. See, in other parts of the world, whatever you are born into, that's what you're going to be. I was teaching somebody English in Egypt, and he was an engineer. His father was a doorman, his grandfather was a doorman, and so on and so on and so forth. So for him to become an engineer when his father was a doorman is very, very rare. That doesn't happen very often. But it happened with him. Because he was able to read very well, so somebody took a chance on him. But is that normal? That's not normal. That's not normal. That's not what happens. You, you, you're stuck in the same rut. Whereas here, you can have nothing, and in theory, you can work your way up. Can you not do that? So you have the opportunities here. So in this way, you don't have to choose between this and you don't have to choose between that. You can mold these together. And every single thing I mentioned does not conflict with Islam. And the other thing we have here is we have freedom of choice. So you can spend your Saturday night doing something else or you can spend your Saturday night uh, in a remembrance like this where the angels are around. It's your choice and your decision. You see? So we blend the best of both worlds. You don't have to choose. So if you're Canadian, and if you're Pakistani, you are now Canadian Stani. And if you are Canadian and you are Somali, you are now Kanasmali or whatever. <laughs> and if you are French and you are Canadian, you know, you just need to chill out. First of all, you just need to chill. And then you can be French Canadian, okay? But you don't have to choose between both. And this is why we used to have this ridiculous thing in the U.S. We say, this is a melting pot. Isn't that the dumbest thing you ever heard is the melting pot? A melting pot means everybody comes and you throw them in a pot and then everybody's the same. So now they started using the phrase salad bowl. Now you're a salad bowl. So the salad, is it mix? Yes, it mixes. But now you have a tomato and then you have you know, an onion or whatever and everybody kind of lives together. And I think you guys, you say quilt, right? Isn't that what they say here? Well, like they, it's a quilt. Everybody brings what they have, but they kind of, they, we build this beautiful blanket and we live together, right? You can't just live isolated by yourself. There's this combination of both. So you do not have to chew. This is important. Now, what can we do so that we blend these kind of identities together? The most important way to combat having a, a dual personality or a split personality is you got to learn your being. There is no shortcut. 
And I got to, let me tell you something about knowledge. Knowledge is not glamorous. I know we're, we're, we live in the YouTube era where you know, everybody wants to see their name and stuff. Is that sincerity? Is that why you want to do it? Why do you want to do it? If you're trying to do it to spread the message, then alhamdulillah. If you're not, then what are you gaining out of it? You're not gaining anything out of it. So spending time, that's why Imam Shafi'i said, one of the requirements of learning is you have to spend a long time. You have to spend a long time. Could you imagine? Imagine you're going to the dentist. And you're sitting there, do you have any dentists here? I always pick on dentists, I'm sorry. So you're going to the dentist, and he's sitting down there, right, and your mouth is like half open, you're trying to have a conversation, and you're trying to, and you're just making small takes that, so, uh, so Doc, where did you study? And he says, oh, I didn't study anywhere, I just Googled this surgery a couple of hours ago. Okay, hold still. And the drill starts going. Is that who you want to operate on you? Who do you want? You want the person who studied for the longest time under the best doctors? That's who you want. That's who you want. That's how knowledge is. And that's how Islamic knowledge is. It takes time and you have to do it all over. Events like this are a start, but it's not the end. If this is all you do the entire year, then you're not going to see any growth. You see, this is like the appetizer. And now you have to take the main course. When you go to any masjid anywhere in North America and the sheikh starts a class, first day of class, how many people are there? Man, you can't even find a seat in there. Third week of class, uh, are we having class? Where'd everybody go? There's like five people. When I started my Arabic program in Canada, the whole room was filled. The whole room was filled. How many did we have by the time the program was over? Two. Two were left. Okay? Why, why does that happen? Because people just think that knowledge doesn't require any effort and they think it's easy and they think that you don't have to do anything to gain it. As the Shaykh mentioned earlier, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are those that know and those that don't know the same? Allah asked this rhetorical question. Isn't it amazing nowadays that we have access to a lot of information but we're not really more knowledgeable, are we? But it's all superficial. Let me just type something up real quick and I'll get the answer. That's not real knowledge and it never will be. So you have to have the knowledge. The second way is the environment that you keep. The environment that you keep is so important. The environment that you keep, as they say, a man is known by the company which he keeps. Show me who, you, who your friends are and I'll show you who you are. And the Prophet ﷺ told us the same concept. Al-mar'u ala dini khalili. That a, a person is on the same, literally, way of life as their best friend. So who's your best friend? Who's your best friend? Do we choose our friends? Of course we choose our friends. Do we choose our family? No. Some of you are like, man, I wish. I never, never have to deal with my cousin Ahmad again. But that is the challenge of the family. That's one reward that Allah gives you. That's one reward He gives you. But then when it comes to the other side, your friends, you chose them. You chose them because you have similar interests. And so because of that, that's going to shape who you are. That's going to determine the company that you keep. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a very powerful reminder in the Quran about the company that we keep. So imagine the scenario that everybody is in Jannah. The believers are in Jannah. And they're hanging out. They're all sitting there, they're all hanging out. This is what we do in Jannah. You, don't, you never turn your back to anybody in Jannah. You're always facing them. Amidst, amongst all this pleasure, amongst all this joy that you're having, somebody says, you know, I remember in the dunya, I used to have a friend. I used to have a friend, and I don't see him here. Why would Allah put this in the Qur'an to show us the importance of what? The kinds of friends that we keep. What did this friend say? This friend used to joke about the religion. This friend used to say, come on, we're not really going like, to become dust and be resurrected. Come on, what is this? Man, you're young, have a good time. Get religious when you're 50. 
This is all fake. When you go to your university, and you go to sociology class, or you go to biology class, what do they teach you about Allah? He's present or not present? They take him completely out of the equation. You know what the difference is? When we as Muslims, when we see something incredible as an invention, we admire what? The creator, not the creation. That's the difference. But in college, what do they do? What do they teach you through the whole school system? Push God out. You know, I, one of my best friends, he entered his freshman year of college, and he became an atheist, completely disbelieved in Allah. By the time he was a junior, he was MSA president. Because Allah guides who he wills. Now, mashallah, he runs an Islamic college. But the reason that he was, he lost his thing is he went into a, into a, a class, it was a philosophy class or sociology, and the first day, the professor said, how many of you believe in God? And most of the students raised their hand. And he said, by the end, you will not believe. And he did that same, he asked that same question towards the end, and the majority did not raise their hand. You see? Because people are, they can be so easily convinced of something this way, that but when they don't have a strong basis. So this is what this friend used to do. He used to mock the religion. He used to say, it's not really going to happen. Then this person in Jannah will ask the other people around him in Jannah, قَالَ هَلْ أَنْتُمْ You want to see him? So then what's going to happen in paradise is like a window opens. A window to look down into Jahannam. And who do they see there? Who does, it, who does he or she see down there? That friend that they were talking about. And then the believer in paradise says, that if it was not only for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for His blessing, I would have been right there with Him. This Arabic verb used kada, it means to have just missed. To have just missed doing something. So I just missed being with that friend down there. I was this close. But because of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I was saved from it, and I did not have to deal with it. So then this person says that they, 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 they're looking down. Now in paradise it's the best thing you've ever seen. Now they're looking down into the hellfire and they jump back almost in shock. Like, oh my God, what did I just see? And they say, are we going to die again? Because their whole mind, they just lose everything. They just forget like where they are. And then it will be said to them, no, you're not going to die again. Because on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring death in the form of an animal. And it will be sacrificed. And it will be said to the people of Jannah, خُلُودٌ فَلَا مَوْتٌ Live forever, no more death. And it will be said to the people of the hellfire, خُلُودٌ فَلَا مَوْتٌ You also live forever, there's no more death. No more death. So this person, this believer, believer will be reminded that there is no more death. And so in this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us the importance of the company that we keep. If you are hanging around people who place an importance on doing well in school, then you're probably going to do well in school or give yourself a better chance. If you're hanging around people who are failing school, then you're probably not going to take your academics very seriously. Whatever your interests are in it, then you are going to protect yourself from having a split identity. Do you think anybody like tonight is going to be like, imagine like 10 people, 10 brothers leave from here, and they go home and they say, man, it was a wonderful program. Uh, you want to go to the club now? Is that going to happen? No. Because the group protects you. The group protects you, and you will be protected. There's a reason we pray our prayers in Jama'ah, in a group. There's a reason we gather every Friday in a group. There's a reason we gather, gather every Eid in a group. Groups are very important in Islam. And the group will protect you from having this split personality. From being one way in front of somebody, and one way in another one, uh, in front of somebody else. Okay, so the friends that you keep. If you don't remember anything this entire conference, just remember that. Now. Another point to make, 
When you have molded this identity together, when you are dealing with non-Muslims, and they ask you a question, you will answer it and you won't try to hide. You see, a lot of people try to be slick and they're not straightforward. And a lot of times when you're straightforward, it will be a whole lot easier for you. The more you try to hide your Islam or dance around it, the less people respect you. They don't respect you more. They don't respect you more. So people will say things like, let's say you have to take off time from work to go to Jum'ah. Two, there's two ways to handle it. One person will come and say, I have religious service on Friday. I need to take three hours off between 12 and 2. And I will come back and I will make up the time and I will work later than anybody else. If you say that like that to a reasonable employee or uh, employer, do you think they're going to say no? Probably not. They're going to say what? Go ahead. Go ahead and go. How do some people say they come in, their eyes get all big. I need three hour lunch on Friday. Do they understand? They have no idea what you're talking about. All they're seeing is that the guy named Muhammad, hopefully not Mo, the guy named Muhammad wants to take a three hour lunch on Friday. Well, what do you think Bob, who's sitting next to you is saying, I want to take a three hour lunch too. This is crazy. Just explain to them, they will respect you more. It's for religious service. When I was sitting, the, uh, in, in one job I had, the first day he showed me how to use the software and stuff. He said, this is your calendar. I said, okay, can you do me a favor? Could you block off Friday from like 12 to 2 p.m. right now? He said, sure. Uh, and why, why is that? I said, I have prayer service. Okay, no problem. No problem. He blocked it off. You have to take time off for Eid. We're not getting into how you do it. Uh, determine that step. Please, please don't, don't ask that, but that question is banned from this conference. But let's say you do it off signing. Like for us, we do it off signing in our community. Person A, I have a religious holiday. It is like Christmas to you or Easter to you. That's our religious holiday. I would like to take either Wednesday or Thursday off but I will be taking one of those days off because we run on a lunar, lunar calendar. We run on a lunar calendar. And so because of that, I, I won't know exactly until the night before. But I will be there one of the two days. So for now, I'll just plan to take both off, but I'll be in one. Okay, that's, I understand. I've said that. Okay, lunar calendar. Okay, cool. I understand. What do other people say? I need to take Wednesday or Thursday off, but I'm not really sure which day. I'll let you know on Tuesday night. Employer is completely confused. What are you talking about? Just explain the situation. Stop trying to hide your Islam more. You need a place to pray. You know what, you know what I always say? The answer is always no to any question unless you ask. If you never ask, it's always no. Why don't you just ask? I mean, what, what right-minded employee is going to say, no, you can't do this? Especially if you have shown your character and you have shown how well you work in general. Right? So that is the complete opposite of having the dual identity. They're going to say, oh yeah, this is Muhammad, and he's a hard worker, and he does well, and therefore we're going to bring him in. So don't try to hide your Islam. You end up just making a fool out of yourself, and you end up making things more difficult for yourself. But always have an understanding of the other person's perspective. Okay? The last thing I'll mention is there are two du'as that I would recommend everybody makes. Number one, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who changes hearts, keep my heart firm on your religion. Because Allah can change anybody's heart in any way at any second. So don't ever think that anybody's a lost cause. Where, when my dad was going around, he always tells me this story. There was a man, he would pray every prayer in the masjid, in jama'ah, but only in Ramadan. As soon as Ramadan was over, khalas, he's just sitting there, the adhan is going up, he's doing nothing. So one day, my grandmother said to him, what do you, is, just a very innocent comment, what is, uh, is, is prayer only in Ramadan? Allah turned his heart somehow, for the rest of his life, he never missed a prayer in jama'ah in the masjid. He would close his store and he would go. Allah changes the hearts. No matter where we are, and even the other way, it works the other way too. Sometimes people say, you know, 
Yeah, at the, at the program or at the halakha or whatever, it's the same people coming every week. Maybe that's the reason they're maintaining their deen in the first place. We don't just start saying now like, oh no, or this is my favorite, people say, oh you know, you know Muhammad or Aisha, oh they're good. SubhanAllah, yeah they got it all figured out. You have to keep these things going. You have to keep it consistent. Because Allah can change it. And that's why I lead you to the second dua in Surah Al-Imran, at the bottom of the first page. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِرُ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَبْ Oh Allah, don't change our heart after you guided us. Don't change our heart after you've already put us on the straight path. And this is something we need to be aware of. Otherwise we start becoming arrogant. We start saying, well I'm at the conference and I know that these people aren't. I go to the masjid and this person doesn't. This is a test. And that's why the more you learn, whether it's here or whether it's in your weekly classes, you're supposed to become more humble. You don't become more arrogant. You're supposed to become more kind of forgiving of people. And this is why you see people who are more knowledgeable and who are more experienced, they're less quick to jump to, jump, to kind of jump to a conclusion about somebody. Because they know. Because they know. So we ask Allah to not change our heart and twist our heart after we were guided. So that we continue to do it. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us uh, from amongst those who are proud of our Muslim identity. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who do not hide our, our identity. Uh, inshallah, if we follow these couple of things we, we can do, we have understood that there does not have to be any sort of clash between your Western identity and your Islamic identity and your Islamic values. And we don't need to have these conversations anymore. I mean, could you imagine if you had to choose? If you have to choose, and then you realize you can't eat biryani anymore, you can't do it, or you can't eat the Somali dish with bananas, which I don't remember, I asked the guys, I haven't had it. But in, imagine now, no, you, you either have that, or you have the poutine. I want both. I mean, I personally am not going to have the poutine, but you guys, if you like it, or those ketchup flavored chips that you guys have, those are, you know, whatever, whatever makes you happy, I'm going to but you don't have to choose. You can have both. So let's remember this, inshallah. And remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah will never put you in a situation that is too difficult for you to handle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never, no matter how difficult it seems, no matter how hard it looks like things are getting, He will never put you in a situation and He will never make you handle more than you are capable of. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our identity as Muslims and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite our hearts.